Good morning, good morning. Welcome to New Mercies. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's take a moment and bring this morning's worship to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for this opportunity to come together here at New Mercies. We pray for all those that are here this morning and those that aren't able to make it and just ask for your blessing upon everyone. We pray for Pastor as he brings the word and we especially pray for our own hearts that they would open and hear that word that we would carry with us this week and that uh, others would see you and us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and help us make a joyful noise.
morning, another beautiful day, another opportunity to come into the house of the Lord and worship. Uh, uh, God, is, God is good, and uh, we're thankful for all that he does for us. Uh, for a few announcements uh, this morning, not too many. Uh, Community Day is coming up August 12th. That's a little bit uh, ways away yet, but uh, make sure you don't schedule anything for that time. And I'm sure they'll be having a meeting in the not too distant future uh, to uh, start signing up for different things that need to be done. Uh, the ladies' Bible study will meet at our house uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30, and any women that would like to come are, are invited uh, to come and be a part of that. For our prayer request, we have uh, several. Uh, Pete was in the hospital a little bit, uh, checking up on his heart. They might uh, put a pacemaker in, a monitor on him, and some things like that, so remember him. Uh, Bernie Alpers uh, fell uh, at her house outside, landed on her face, and uh, um, broke some vertebrae or something in her neck, so she's not able to do anything for six weeks. So no driving, no riding the lawnmower around or anything like that. So remember her. And uh, Jeff and Nancy's son, also Jeff, but they call him Buzz. Uh, he's in the hospital with some type of a blockage. Uh, and they're finding out a lot of things, but uh, not solving the problem yet. But uh, uh, please be in prayer for him as well. And. Uh, remember our elderly too, Bob Copeflesh, who's home, uh, lives with his daughter now. Uh, just keep him in your prayers as well. Uh, let's bow at this time for prayer. Father, we're so thankful for the life that we have. You created a beautiful world for us to be a part of. You fill us with so many blessings of the beauty around us, the friends that we have, the family that we have, the love that we can share with other people. So many reasons, Father, that we have to stop and to give thanks. But most of all, Father, we give thanks for your son, Jesus, who was willing to leave the glories of heaven to come and put up with what he had to put up with because he saw us in our need, saw us in our sin and came that we might have life through the forgiveness that he offers and the resurrection that he gives to each of us. Bless us as we're here today. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, you're going to be the choir. Uh, Linda and I went to Johnson Bible College. She came from West Virginia, I came from Ohio, and uh, we went to Johnson Bible College a school of about 250 students was all that was there now. Their uh, college was started in 1893, uh, a, a wonderful place to go. Uh, they have several different things that they had plaques on the wall, but one of them was open day and night to the poor young man who desires above every desire to preach the gospel. Uh, they had a farm where people could work, uh, make their way through school, uh, and a college that exalted uh, Christ. Uh, one of the things that we did, we had chapel five nights a week at seven o'clock, and you would go in, have a chapel service, and somebody would speak. The junior preaching students would have to preach a sermon, and then when they became seniors, they had to preach another sermon. Uh, but the singing was spectacular. And I remember one time, one of the, a lot of the students had churches where they preach on the weekend, and he wanted to record the song that we're going to do now uh, to take back to his church because they didn't uh, sing the way we did at, at school. So uh, what, what I'm asking you to do now is turn to 338, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. How many know the song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus? Raise your hand. Okay, lots of you do. Uh, a lot of times, you know, in, in Bible college, we'd sing parts, and so it'd be like one big part. Uh, and the, the sopranos usually get the melody, you know, that's the top line. There's four, four notes there, with the top soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And usually the sopranos get the melody, and the basses get the bass line. Uh, 
But on this song, the men get to sing the lead on the first part of the chorus. So you're looking at the book and the bottom of the first page, uh, and Cherry's going to play the bass part. Um, and we, the men, we will sing the bass part. It's the melody. Uh, so you don't have to read music. It's just the melody. Uh, so we will sing it once, maybe twice, um, and then we'll have the women and Dan's going to lead the women uh, on their part <laughs> on this place. <laughs> Good thing about Dan is he can sing all four parts <laughs> and actually read the music. So, uh, bottom of page uh, 338. Uh, There was, it's not page 338, it's Psalm 338. And there's a difference. Somebody pointed this out to me when I was in high school uh, back at the Painesville Church of Christ. <laughs> it was George Hobbs's father, I think it was at the time, pointed out because that means absolutely nothing but. <laughs> I just I sort of. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, just the bass line, and it's, and all the men will sing that. Don't have to worry about the tenor, um, because, well, there's, there's only one part there, and that's the melody, and so we get to sing melody there, okay? Just give me a chord, and then we'll start. Oh, yeah, turn the piano on. You can sing with us. Dan will sing with us on this too. <laughs> Ready, man? Wonderful the acts of grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty flowing sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. That's it. That's all we need. Because then we go back and we do the bass line and the women get the melody again. But men, let's try that again. Let's let's all sing out now. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like the fountain, all sufficient grace for me.
And we'll do all three verses, but let's have, I really want to hear it when you have the kind of the cover melody going there that we just practiced. So. <laughs> 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 And we like to sing that song. We had a youth group before church on Sunday night, and we had a, 
uh, the minister's daughter, Jeannie Sizemore, played piano for us. And uh, she was a good piano player. And uh, she always said that that song was really hard to play. And so we wanted to play it, have, make her play it every week. <laughs> but uh, music is uh, a lot of different styles of music and a lot of different ways that we, uh, we use music to praise God. <clears throat> Today we're beginning a new series called The Fundamental List. Um, what is fundamental to the faith? You know, there's uh, a de terms that describe Christians, and one of those terms is fundamentalist. And so that's kind of a play on that word. We are looking at the fundamental list. What are the fundamentals of our faith? A lot of times when a sports team uh, is having problems, you know, they say we need to get back to the fundamentals, get back to the basics. What are the basics uh, for the Christian faith that we need to build on? Sometimes we can get so uh, off track, you know, and you need to get back to what is the, the basis of, of our faith. We spend a lot of time, and most of the time uh, in a sermon, I'm talking about how do we do what we're supposed to do as a Christian. But today we want to, in this series, we want to talk about what is it that we need to believe? Because what you believe should determine and become the foundation for what you do. So we need to understand what it is uh, that we need to do, to, what we need to believe. What is the basics of, of the church? There are many churches today and denominations and uh, different terms that we use. Uh, are you a fundamentalist? I used to think I was a fundamentalist. Uh, are you a conservative? Uh, I used to think I was a conservative, but different terms mean different things to different people. And uh, a fundamentalist, according to the definition, is strict literal interpretation of Scripture. Strict literal interpretation of Scripture. So I, I believe in a strict conservative uh, interpretation of Scripture. The Bible says it, we need to believe it. Uh, so in that sense, I am. Uh, but I'll, uh, and a conservative is one um, who is adverse to change or innovation. Adverse to change or innovation. Uh, we want to stay with what we've always been. Uh, and maybe that's good, but especially in the black community, conservative is not a good word because they don't want to go back to slavery. They don't want to go back to reconstruction in the South where uh, people were lynched. So my idea of going, let's get back to the good old found fundamentals that this country was built on. But sometimes what this country was doing was not right, so we don't want to go back to those things. What's the difference between Protestant and evangelical? According to the definition, the Protestant mainline denominations are liberal. Evangelical churches are fundamental, fundamentalist and conservative. And so do you see that, th that that can create friction within people that claim to be Christians based on how they view the past? Evangelical, to evangelize, means to share the good news. That's kind of the, and so I'm an evangelical because I want to share the good news of Christ. But I don't want to go back to, to times that were not good to some people where the church maybe even oppressed other people. So a lot of different things. Uh, do you know why Protestants are called Protestants? Because they are protesting the Catholic Church. The Protestant movement came with Martin Luther, uh, John Calvin, Zwingli, and a bunch of other people in that period of time where the Catholic Church had become very corrupt and Martin Luther said, you don't have to pay to have your sins forgiven. That was one of the big things uh, that Martin Luther said, you know, uh, where you paid to have your sins forgiven. Uh, and so 
they became protesting the, uh, what the church was teaching at the time and started all the, many of the mainline denominations started during that period of, that period of time. So am I a Protestant? No, I'm, I'm a part of the restoration movement uh, which started in the early 1800s, that's my background, where churches in the United States said, what, what should the church be? You know, people had come from, a lot of them were Presbyterian, and it had to do with the government, you know, back in Scotland, and they said, what's it got to do with us? And so they said, let's not, um, let's restore. We don't want to reform another church. We want to restore the New Testament church that Jesus started that we find in the Bible. And so that movement was called the Restoration Movement. We're not trying to reform something. We are trying to restore the church back <clears throat> in the beginning. And so I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of denominations there are. Because the more conservative you are, uh, you know, the idea <clears> that <throat> I've said this before, but maybe you don't remember it, but uh, in essentials, unity, in opinions, liberty, and in all things, love. So what's essential? The more conservative you are, the more things you think are essential. I mean, there are some churches that believe that you can only use one cup for communion. Because when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, there was one cup and they passed it around. And so they say, well, if that's the way Jesus did it, that's the way we have to do it. Uh, so the more conservative you are, the more things are essential, and the fewer people will agree with you, but uh, so there's more and more uh, divisions within the church. How we worship, and some of these things we'll look at down the road. What's your view of the, of the Holy Spirit? What's your view of the second coming? What's your view of the understanding of, of faith and works and how those two concepts go together? Are we saved by our works? No. Are we saved by faith? Yes. But faith without works is dead. So, I mean, you can use scripture to come up with whatever doctrine you want and then get, find a scripture that will support it. Or you can say, well, God, what are you trying to tell me here? And be open to his leading and to be willing to listen to other people and what they say and then sort it out uh, for yourself. Even the translations of the Bible. There are some people that believe you should only use the King James Version of the Bible. That's good enough for Paul. You know, it's good enough for me. But King James was a translation uh, that I think was 1611, if I'm not mistaken. King James authorized the translation of the Bible. Well, he wanted to translate the Bible, um, especially because he didn't, well... Anyway, he started the Church of England. He wanted his church to have their Bible. Uh, but we divide over so many things. There's a, everybody has a different opinion, but one thing we can all agree on, and that is I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> all the different denominations think they're right and everybody else is wrong. And I'll have to admit, you know, when I was growing up, I thought our church had it right, you know, and I think we had it right, but other churches probably had it right too. Especially as, as you look at some of the songs that were written by people from different traditions, you know, and denominations and stuff. I mean, the song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Wonderful, the massless grace of Jesus. How Great is his grace. Somebody wrote that song that didn't go to my church, you know? Uh, and, and that's the, the way it is. And that's why sometimes we can become so dogmatic that our way is right and everyone else is wrong. It has to be my way or you're wrong. That's like it is in politics today, you know? And that's why as we get away from what God wants us to be, to be servants, to be humble, to be learning, to be examining the scriptures and finding the best way in that scripture, it, the fact that we've gotten away from that is affecting our whole culture. So what is actually necessary 
that we must agree on, and there are things that we must agree on, but there's also a lot of things that aren't necessary. In opinions, liberty. In essentials, unity, they're the fundamental things we have to agree on. But there's a lot of other things that are opinions, uh, and we have to be able to get along. So what's cultural? What did you grow up believing? What were your circumstances growing up? What are you comfortable with? What are you fashionable uh, with? What is traditional that you, uh, these ideas? A lot of our, what we believe is, is where we were brought up, how we were brought up, and those kind of things. Uh, and those are matters of opinion, but then there are some things that are harmful and divisive. Sometimes churches get off track. Uh, mainline denominations especially change what they believe. What, the, what their denomination believed 30 years ago or 50 years ago is totally different from what, it, what they believe today. And so maybe as uh, the church denomination changes, you get to the point where you say, well, I don't agree with that. And so you have to, it becomes obvious to us that, 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 that's, that they're, they're wrong as churches change and denominations change. And it gets to the point where you have to make a decision. Am I going to stay with that denomination, that church, or will I leave? Uh, there's an old expression that goes back to 1512. You probably didn't realize that. This goes back to 1512. It's a German uh, expression. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What does that mean? It means sometimes there's things you don't want so you get rid of it, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, in your zeal to rid yourself of something harmful or unwanted, don't inadvertently rid yourself of something valuable and important. So how does that relate to the fundamentals that we have in the church. We have to hold on to those fundamentals. Um, every generation comes up with things that are new, that are novel, and you know, ideas that can come in. Some are helpful for evangelizing. You know, we, we have the opportunity now, we have more people watching our service online than we do coming into church. So it's a good thing, it's new, and it's good to use those tools to share the gospel with other people. Some things are good. Some things that we add maybe aren't so good. And sometimes those, those ideas, there's been trends, conversational prayer, do you remember that? Years ago, prayer was just, we're just talking to God and conversational prayer was a big thing. And there are other kind of things that are good, but not necessarily it has to be that way. Um, and some of these things can be elevated to the, the status of doctrine. Going all the way back, you know, in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians, I don't have a lot of scriptures today because this is more introduction. Uh, but going back to Corinthians, the church in Corinth, they were dividing over who was they were following, you know, some follow Paul, up. I follow Paulus, you know, God gave the increase, you know, he's the only one that matters. So don't be divisive. And in 1 John, I didn't put this scripture in there, but John warned against false teachers that would come in and teach things that weren't right. So back even to the very beginning, there were problems in the church which caused division and to get off track. And if we reject the bad that comes into the church, sometimes people just say, I've had enough. I know people that left the church, that a church was going through problems, they had people on one side, people on another side, and some people just said, they weren't on either side, but they just said, I'm tired of all the arguing, I'm just gonna quit. Some of those people go to another church, some of them, they just give up, they don't go to any church. And so that's why unity is so important, because some people just get tired of arguing. And so we don't want to argue. We want to 
agree on the essentials and have freedom when it comes to other areas. And so we hold up everything that we do and everything that we teach to what Jesus taught in, while he lived in his life. To make sure we're following the fundamentals and that we have a proper attitude when it comes to the other things. Because some things that are brought in are unchristian. Some things that come into the church are even anti-Christian. And so when people come, I mean, we've had people come here and their teaching is so different and they're so strong in what they believe that we're wrong and they're right. Uh, it wouldn't work to have people like that here saying, well, you people are really wrong and I'm here to straighten you out. You know, what would that do? That would tear the church apart because everybody would have to take sides and all of these kind of things, and uh, we can't have that. New ideas appeal to some groups. You know, I mean, some people are, human trafficking is a serious problem. And we need to, you know, care about that, pray about that, and if we have an opportunity, do something about that. So, um, and I think sometimes people want, in politics want to use the church both the, the liberal side and the conservative side want to use the church and manipulate the church to, to gain power for their base. And those things are wrong as well. Uh, maybe the church isn't as socially active as we should. If there's wrong in our culture, we need to speak out against it. But we also don't want to be so conservative on the other side uh, so there's a balance and evaluate each situation because everybody says, I'm following what the Bible says. And if you don't follow what I say, you're going against scripture. Uh, and that can, you know, make, make you uh, uneasy. Uh, some churches are so authoritarian that uh, it has, to, you have to live your life exactly the way they tell you to live. Uh, if not, they'll throw you out. And, uh, you know, that, that could be a problem. We can make the Bible say whatever we want it to. Or we can say, God, what are you trying to tell me? And follow that uh, as we go forward. Uh, but what did Jesus say? What do we measure everything by? Do we love God? And are we loving our neighbor and even our enemies? That is the, the goal that, that God sets. All the law and all the prophets come down to those, those things. And so we don't want to get to the place where people say, the church is so off track, I have to leave the church in general. Uh, I don't know how many times I've had people say, why don't you go to church? You know, I asked that question. I had a bad experience. I went to church. I needed help. I didn't get help. When I went to church and something bad happened. And so sometimes we have to leave a church, but we can't leave the church because that is our source of our hope, our, our help. Uh, some bad experiences uh, can, can create a lot of problems. And if we just say, well, I'm still following God, but I just don't want to be in part of any organized religion. The church was designed by God. Jesus said, I will build my church. We are the, the church is to be the body of Christ. And so the church is helpful in many ways. If you're not a part of a church, then worship, I mean, coming together to worship, isn't that uplifting to start the week? You know, we come together and we sing songs that are uplifting and that praise God. Uh, we come to the church, we get teaching. Uh, you know, we can all be selfish. We, can all, we all need to be challenged to be better at how we live and how we follow Jesus. And if you're not a part of a church where you, you are around people that you respect, 
uh, what they say, how they live, what they believe, and come up and says, do you think about that? Maybe you ought to do that differently. You know, maybe you ought to, you know, say to that other person, even if you don't think you were wrong, you probably were wrong. You know, say, hey, I'm sorry for what happened. If there's a, a break in a relationship, we need to go to each other and be the first one to go there, you know, and say, hey, I'm sorry. What, you know, would you forgive me for this? Uh, and then we can have healing. Uh, if we don't, if we're not a part of a fellowship, we can just get off on some tangent and, and be far down the road from where we want to be. We need the fellowship. We need the encouragement and we need the support. And so we want the church to be that place where we focus on the main thing and people don't have to leave because we're doing stuff that is, is against God's word. Why is it difficult? Sometimes, you know, we put God in a box and say, this is what it is to be a Christian. And if you agree with what we have in our God box, then you can be here and that's fine. If you don't, then, you know, that's, that's a problem. But we need to be able to ask questions because we aren't going to all agree on, on some of the things, not, hopefully not the essentials. But a faith that can't be questioned can't be trusted. You know, do this. Why? Well, does it work? Does it, are you trusting in asking that question? And sometimes people leave the church because there's something about that's going on in their life that uh, is kind of difficult. Um, we can't make the Bible just simplistic and this and that. You know, everybody knows the story. Moses divided the Red Sea. The children of Israel went across. And so we could say, well, God will protect us in every situation. And the good people will, will go through and be unscathed by the situation. And the bad people, they're going to be drowned. If you ever stopped and thought, I'm going through a pretty hard time right now. I, I kind of think I'm drowning. And somebody said, well, you just don't have enough faith. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Or David and Goliath. David uh, killed Goliath, the, the giant. We all know the story. But sometimes we feel like we're losing. We're not winning in every situation. But Jesus talked to real people about real life. And if we make Christianity so simplistic that you do the right thing and you'll have no problems in your life, everything will go the way you want it to go, you're going to have a hard time and you're going to say, well, maybe, maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe something's wrong here. But we need to come back. Uh, Karen Armstrong uh, is an author, said this, we all learned about God about the same time we were told about Santa Claus but while our understanding of the Santa Claus phenomenon evolved and matured, our theology remained somewhat infantile. I mean, we grew up and we, we, we understood why Santa Claus isn't real. Hope all the children are gone. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> our, our view of God has to grow and understand. We don't believe in God just because our parents told us there was a God, but you know, we believe in God because the heavens declare the glory of God. We, you look at his word, his wisdom, his truth, changes how we live, that Jesus came and gave his life for us. Um, and so, but we need, we need to grow up. Um, just want to look in our remaining time in our scripture. Pretend you've never heard this before. There's no church. There's no Christ. Uh, or there's no salvation, no resurrection, nothing like that. Jesus, later in his ministry, is talking with his disciples. Uh, 
And Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The Son of Man is a term used especially by Daniel and other prophets in the Old Testament that God would send him into the world. They replied, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So who do people say that you are? Well, a lot of you know, debate about who he is, and maybe he's Elijah come back because there was a prophecy that one like Elijah would come, but that was John the Baptist, uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then he say, who do you say that I am? Now, they'd been together about three years. They'd seen the miracles. They'd seen the teaching. They'd, uh, you know, heard the parables that he taught. Uh, they had seen him, and they had followed him uh, for that period of time. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The statement of faith that Peter made was that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And that is the foundation that we all have. It's where it all starts, that God sent his son into the world. Is that true? If God, if Jesus was God in the flesh, then that's the foundation for our faith. Um, used to be everybody kind of believed in God. But now maybe, you know, there's so many skeptics teaching so many different things that, that we don't make that assumption so much anymore. But this is, that statement of faith is what the church is built on. And that is the, the foundation. If Jesus is the Son of God, everything changes. There was a movie, uh, I don't know what it was years ago, but... Um, uh, God appeared, I forget how he appeared or something, and every, every week at a certain time he would give a message from God. Uh, and then people expected it and it didn't come. And I forget what the, what the thing was, but the idea is that if God spoke in a way that we knew it was God, we would listen to him. He has spoken. Jesus was a real person. He was God. He was a man. And God has spoken to us so we can know who he is. And now it's up to us to decide, are we going to listen to him or not? And that's really what it all comes down to uh, when it comes to, uh, to our faith, and that is, are we willing to listen to who God is? The disciples believed, and then they unbelieved, because Jesus died on the cross. That wasn't in their plan. They thought that Jesus would come be the Messiah, set up a kingdom here on earth, and so they disbelieved, but then he rose from the dead. And that was the clincher to know that he was from God. For, so those of us that believe, that is what gives us the confidence to know who he was, what he said, and what we can gain from our understanding of who he is. And that's the foundation of our faith, that Jesus came from God. And so that gives validity to the scriptures. Everything we can know is true. It's God speaking to us. Because I, th I think if God spoke from heaven with a loud voice, as in that movie, somehow I've, he communicated it, I think people would listen if they knew there was a God and he was speaking to us. I think they would listen. He has spoken. Do we listen? And can we share that? Because everything he says works. And we look at the problems we're in today and we see that 
He's the answer to all of those. I saw a bumper sticker years ago. You know, used to be a bumper sticker, Jesus is the answer. I saw another one that says, what's the question? The question is, what's the meaning and purpose of life? Where does it all go? How do we find the answers that we need? You know, little kids, you know, you ask kids the question, well, what's the answer? And the answer is Jesus. Maybe it's not really the answer, but they know that Jesus, if they answer Jesus, they'll get, the, they'll get credit for it, you know. But we don't just, we understand why Jesus is the answer. We don't just say, oh, I grew up and Jesus is the answer. We understand why he is the answer. And he becomes the foundation, therefore, of our faith. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We look at the church today and there's so much division and uh, we're probably not right all the time, but we are right on the essentials because we look to your word. And we ask that you would help us to, to live in such a way that uh, you can be seen through us and that we can lift up Christ so that others can be drawn to him. Bless us as a congregation as we put our trust and our faith in you and as we grow more and more into the likeness of Jesus, who is our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. I'll say, please stand.